We are officially in the time of year where I just have a continuous string of colds. So I apologize in advance for my voice. I understand that it's terrible. Also, in this review, I'm going to be discussing chapters eight, uh, what was it? 850, maybe I could look so that I don't give false information. 852 through 878. That's the section that I'm reading that I've read up to this point. So this is part two of my Whole Cake Island reviews. Part one will be linked if you missed it, and there will also be a part three. So this is the middle chunk, and there was so much chaos. There was such an abundance of chaos. I really feel like, especially at the end of the section that we're discussing, Oda really put on his silly hat to the fullest extent. I mean, it was it was wild. It was a wild ride. It was fun. There's a lot of stuff to dissect, but also there's some sections that are so chaotic and silly and great, but not dissect worthy in my opinion. So there are sections that are just wild chaos that I'm kind of just gonna breeze right past for the sake of myself, really, because I'm fatigued. Not with the story at all, just because of the cold. So anyway, where I left off last time was with Jimbei. I'm so sorry for my voice. I'm not gonna keep saying that, but also I really am. Where we left off last time was with Jimbei when Luffy was in an absolute fit because we found out about Pudding being evil. Luffy was uh, thrashing around trying to rip his own arms off. Poor sweet boy. Um, so that he could get to Sanji and then enter Jimbei, the best of Jimmy boys. So what I'm picking up here where uh, they got saved, where Luffy and Nami were rescued. They were brought out of the book, 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 book. And and Luffy is happy and celebrating that they are free and he's going to go get his boy. We also get this really amazing line from Jimbei where Nami says, but then isn't this? And Jimbei says, rebellion? Precisely. There is no turning back now. Nami says, but on Fishman Island, you said that you still had a position to uphold. Well, you just saw me abandon it. There are so many wonderful one-liners for Jimbei in this arc so far, and he hasn't even had much of a presence yet, and yet every single page he's on, I'm just like, ah, oh, Jimbei. Oh man, there's one chapter in particular that we're gonna discuss. I love it so much. So let's talk more about Sanji's family because in the last review, I knew a lot less than I know now, obviously. So dad, not dad, Sanji's biological father, who is not his true father, uh, he, ow, wanted his kids to be killing machines so he decided to experiment on them in the womb when the triplet, quadruplets, wow. The, f the four kids, the four boys were in the womb still and dad decided to do experiment, not dad, decided to do experiments on the kids to make them into the, the fighting machines that he wanted them to be and to remove em emotion from them, which actually really makes a ton of sense because we've seen so much callousness and so much, um, like even just in the introduction when we first are introduced with uh, Yanji is maybe his name and sister whose name I still haven't learned. She deserves better than that, but here I am. And when he was saying, Luffy dying really isn't my problem, so enjoy your life, I'm leaving. And then she stepped in and she's like, I will handle this situation, right? Remember that? Of course you do. So situations like that, which we've seen a couple of, of scenarios where the boys have come off so callous. And now that we know why, that their ability to emote is essentially taken from them, to have emotions, is essentially taken from them. And Sanji is the only, so mom took some medicine while she was pregnant to try to undo what not dad was doing. And so she was trying to help the kids um, reverse. She was trying to help them have feelings and emotions and compassion. And it only worked on Sanji. And that's why Sanji is abundantly over the top uh, yeah, I don't know, emotional and at least, I don't know, I guess maybe, I don't really remember if the manga, I'm pretty sure the manga did say the reason he has so much compassion is because of what his mom did trying to reverse the effects. I like to think that the reason 
Sanji picks a core value, like what his dad taught him, Crap Geezy, Crap Geezer taught him, his true father taught him, about like this thing that's from the dinosaur age of honoring women, um, his values for cooking, stuff like that. I like to think that the reason he's such an extremist and he takes it almost too far to the point of, you're gonna feed somebody who's then gonna turn around and try to kill you and everyone you love, but you're gonna feed them and give them the ability to do that, or his over-the-topness with the way he simps after women, or his over-the- well, I guess his brothers do that too, don't they? They're pretty over-the-top. His over-the-topness of protectiveness of women. I like to think that maybe that all the messing, all the th ways in which his parents mess with him in the womb, his mom with good intentions, all the ways in which his parents mess with him in the womb potentially just kind of makes him an extremist in certain ways. When he chooses something, he's like, I'm all in wholeheartedly. There is no balance here. I don't know, maybe I'm reading into things way too much. But it does explain his brothers really, really well into why they're so callous and really kind of removes them from the role of villain to an extent because they don't have any agency as far as all this stuff goes. Like, they don't get to look at what their dad is doing and say, oh, he's totally in the wrong here. I'm going to rebel. No, they don't have that as an option. So really, they're not even villainous characters anymore. They do villainous things, but it's against their will. They really have no will at this point, or at least not enough to be able to make decisions apart from him. But of course, there could be more nuance to that that I really realized because Sister also said that she doesn't have the ability to disobey her father. She has to follow every one of his commands. And then immediately thereafter, on the very next page, she says that uh, she, let's see. She says, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention earlier, those bracelets on you, they're not going to explode. I switched them out for ordinary ones. So I don't know. I was discussing this with my patrons and they looked back and we never saw dad get not father. We never saw Sanji's bio father give her the command, hey, put these bracelets on him. So we can, I guess, kind of fill in the blanks and say, that uh, he, that she anticipated him doing something terrible. And so she took those bracelets and said, I'm going to do this and then switch them out. I don't know. We, we're not really given enough information to really know what happened here. It looks like she disobeyed his orders immediately. Yeah. It looks like she said, I'm unable to disobey his orders. And then on the very next page said, by the way, I disobeyed his orders. So we kind of have to fill in blanks to make this make sense. So I'm not really sure to what capacity they are under his, his reign, his rule, his commands. It's a bit murky, but either way, I have a lot more forgiveness for the brothers than I did before because I realized that a lot of their agency has been stolen from them and Sanji is really the only one that was rescued in his mom's attempt to rescue them all. Anyway, I love, I love how intense Luffy is when he is after protecting his own, when he's after protecting his crewmates or really anyone that he's decided needs his protection, how all in he is, how full force he goes. And I love this panel of him choking this brute of a man to try to find out where Sanji is, to figure out how to get to his crewmate who he knows needs him because he's now learned about the pudding reveal that I'm still quite frankly mad about in the best way. It was a great reveal. Also, I have so much love for Sanji's sister. I really, really hurt for her, the fact that at least some some of her agency is taken from her as well, that she was augmented to have to obey her father's orders. And so because of that, she has become a killer and she has done horrendous things that we don't even fully know about. And she doesn't believe, like she wants to save Sanji because somebody in her family has compassion and has the ability to remove themselves from him, but she doesn't. And she knows what she's done by his command. And so she feels that she doesn't deserve to live even if her father and brothers were to die, she still feels that she should die too because of the blood on her hands. Really similar to uh, Dressrosa, Kairos or something. I don't know, man. And it really hurts me. I just want to sit her down and I just want to say, it's not your fault. What you have done against your will is not, it's not on your hands. It's not your fault. 
I know you deserve PTSD over over what's what you've had to do against your will, but you don't deserve death over it. Pedro is still awesome. He's an amazing character. Everything he does is just so cool, and I still feel guilty for sussing him for a minute. Oh yeah, I also really really love the scene when 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 Luffy goes and speaks with with Sanji's sister and finds out that Sanji knows about pudding, and then he's like, okay, awesome, he knows. That's all I needed. And then he flings himself out the window and runs to the spot that he promised Sanji he would be so that he could wait for him because he knew his boy was coming back to him. Oh my goodness, I adore Luffy. All right, so Brooke still isn't in the know-how, so conveniently, Mom decides to repeat her plan back to Pudding that Pudding already knows about is and is in the midst of executing so that Brooke can hear it, so that he can be in the know-how, so that we can move forward. Eh, I don't like it, but whatever. It's not that big of a deal. I'll let it slide because this entire sequence with Mom and Brooke is so good. <laughs> I'm so... Oh, man. I don't know, guys. I think Brooke is... I think Brooke is sailing to the top of my list. Not, not the top, but he's up there in my list of straw hats. He's just... This... Brooke is the secret star of this arc. We have so many funny scenes of him, uh, like when he and mom are taking a nap together and the crew decides to come and try to save him and she thinks it's a fly and it's it's this whole, whole to-do. But I love Brooke actually just soundly napping with her and then he sees something and he's like, what, what was that? Oh, just a fly. And just like passes back out. And then the whole shenanigans of them trying to rescue him and it's a mess, and they one by one make their own attempts, and it's just terrible. But Jinbei, the other secret star of this arc, got him out, and they switched him out with the dummy, and it's just, it's just fun. There's just so much fun happening in this section of the arc. And then once they're all free, we get this scene of Brooke just casually, them all apologizing, and you know, they're they're like, we'll still move forward. We didn't accomplish our goal, but it's okay. And then Brooke just being like, what are you talking about? And then he busts his head open to give us the tracings that he's gotten. And it's just, you know, I think Brooke is amazing. I think Brooke is amazing. I still have qualms with him, but quite frankly, he's amazing. His, his casual way, the fact that he's so competent, that he is constantly behind the scenes making things happen so effectively, like he's ridiculously powerful. He's, he's able to do everything almost that he sets out to do. And then he just so casually is like, oh no, I, I, I did it. Like, I, I took care of it. And it's just, uh, his very vacant way of handling things. Does that make sense? The way he just handles stuff and then vacantly is just like, oh yeah, of course, I took care of it. it it's something so impressive, but he it's almost like he doesn't, it doesn't register in his brain how impressive he truly is. I really like him. Anyway, Sanji is, at the same time that Luffy is fighting to get to his boy, Sanji is fighting to get to his. And so we get to see the two guys uh, rushing to their meeting spot and, and then they find each other. This incredible scene of Luffy being at his end, of being dried up, withered away, uh, a shell of, of what he should be as he's waiting for Sanji, kind of like an old man with severe injuries. Sanji finding him and providing the food. And Oda, I didn't miss your parallels with Sanji's mom when he gives Luffy the food and he eats it so happily and Sanji calling him a liar when he says that the food is good. It's just, man, it's a scene. And it's with with all the buildup of, of, of Sanji feeling much like his siblings, like his agency is being taken from him, like he has no choice but to follow his father's commands and having to turn on his captain and say things that he never would have wanted to say to him, hurt him like he never would have wanted to do. And then them being separated and them rushing back together, all this build up, this one quiet scene delivered. Perfect. Perfect. But that's not all. Sanji then going on to say that after what he's done, much like his sister, it's unforgivable. What he's done against his will is unforgivable, and now he can't join the straw backs the straw hats back after what he did. 
And again, I gotta look back at Usopp, even though the reasoning behind what Sanji did and Usopp did in Innis Lobby are totally different, and there's so many differences about it, but I gotta look back because Sanji was the one that found Usopp practicing his return to the Straw Hats, and Sanji was the one that went running back to Luffy to tell him, Usopp wants us back. He wants to join with us again, and he was ready to welcome him with open arms despite Usopp defecting, saying terrible things, and fighting Luffy. It's a different situation, but still the parallels. And Sanji was the one that was ready to open him, to, to bring him back with open arms despite all those things. And yet when it's Sanji in this position, Sanji says, I don't deserve to come back. Then on top of that, he also explains, I can't come back anyway because I can't let the innocent die because of me and I can't let the guilty die because of me either. My family is terrible, but I can't let them go out this way. And I love that this isn't necessarily painted as the right thing to do, like Sanji is honorable by doing this. It's more just like, I gotta do what's right for me and that's good enough. Just the same when Lola's sister, what was her name? truffle? <laughs> I don't know. Lola's sister, Lola's twin, when she says, I'm abandoning my family to die and I'm protecting my husband and my kid, that also isn't painted as the wrong choice or the right choice. It's just, it's what she needed to do and, and there you go. That's good enough. Anyway, after Sanji explains his position, Luffy choosing then and only then to hit Sanji after everything they've been through. He didn't, he didn't raise a hand, but then he hits him and says, tell the truth. And then Sanji admits, I do want to come back. For the first time, not saying what he thinks he has to say, but saying what's honest. For the first time in a long time, he's finally just telling the truth. And then Luffy responding with, okay, let's go. Let's take care of this with you then. Reminding him that no matter what, you are not alone. You always have your crew. Man, this is just a really good scene. Oh, right, and I can't, I can't leave out the fact that when the crew hears that he wants to come back, that there's this such a massive, intense celebration that it knocks him down. There's just, it's just, it's just. I love my little found family. I love them so much. Um, we find out that the marriage that Lola ran from and that made mom so mad was a giant alliance, alliance with giants. And, uh, and oh man, there's a lot of reasons why they have a bad relationship with the giant nation. But essentially this was like her last hope at restoring her relationship with the giants after when she was a kid, she killed one and then it was just, it's just, it's not been good. It's not been good for her in the realm of the giants. But this was supposed to restore that. She was supposed to have giants on her island in her living in harmony dream that from a caramel, it's, whew, whew. but that was dashed and no wonder she's so mad at her daughter. Not that, that, I mean, I don't, it's still not good, but that's why she is so mad at Lola from running for that marriage because it dashed her last hope and that's why she's trying to use science to get herself there. Man, then we find out that the cigar guy, the mafia cigar guy who's married to Lola's twin is actually also defecting from mom and in fact is trying to kill her. So we're joining the mafia for a little while. And man, it's funny. I made the joke when I was doing the live reading, when I found out that he was, that he hated mom too. And I, and I was like, oh, we'll just team up with him then. I didn't mean it. I was being silly because that just didn't seem reasonable, but that's what we did. We cleaned up, had a meeting. It looks super cool. I love these panels of them sitting around and discussing their, their mafia takeout plan. And then, and oh, Caesar's there, which I, the gags in this arc are great. We create a near impossible plan. And at this point, when we're discussing this, this five, we have five seconds to execute all these things and everything has to go off without a hitch. In my mind, I'm thinking, and this is one of my, this is one of, I guess, the negatives you could call it for me reading not week to week is the fact that I look at the arc and I say, okay, I still have near half this arc left or half this arc, I don't know. And so I know that this plan is not gonna go off without a hitch and we're not gonna skip into the sunset. So my thought was that we were gonna fail and we were gonna try all these things. It wasn't gonna work. 
whatever for whatever reason and then mom is going to open that trunk that we sent her in Fishman Island remember with the bomb I figured then she would open that up and it would blow up and kill her and that was how we would defeat her but it would be this long convoluted thing to get to there and I I mean at this point of the arc she's still rampaging so I mean I don't know what's gonna happen now but I, I it it did not go well the plan did not go well as one would expect. Especially, it's kind of like a rule in writing. If you map out the plan, if you say step by step, we're going to do this, 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 and that's the plan, then the reader can pretty much know that's going to fail. And it's when the plan is really vague and the reader has to just go with it and, and be surprised with the different steps that come up, that's usually, more, that's more likely to be the plan that'll succeed because it would be boring to get a step-by-step -step plan and then execute that plan and then hooray, we celebrate, right? It doesn't matter. Anyway, a lot of, of this plan is being entrusted to Luffy, which is great because Luffy is wonderful, but also terrible because Luffy is very bad at following plans. But don't worry, he's gonna make a cool entrance. I love this kid so much. So the tea party starts, we have this wonderful ce celebration atop a cake. It's all charming and fun, and mom is still terrifying and looming. And here's my problem, is we have these scenes with Sanji where he's he's aware of what's happening, he knows Pudding has betrayed her, and that she's so daggum adorable that he's very conflicted because he wants to be he wants to be wooed by her charms, but he knows that she's bad. And I I'm in the same boat. I still love her. I still have so much affection for her. I haven't fully reconciled with the fact that her cute, adorable shtick is an act. I know she's evil, but I still kind of want to marry her. But anyway, Sanji and in his incredible compassion and his incredible kindness and respect, he when the, we get to the wedding bit and she reveals her third eye, he compliments her. He tells her she's beautiful. He tells her that that eye is beautiful. And then we kind of get this realization, which has already been built up somewhat, that mom, as well as anybody that's ever seen her eye, the reaction is, you're kind of disgusting and hideous and, you know, hide that. Which is damaging and would scar anyone. And so she has this uh, evil demeanor, but also this great insecurity of like, the, the third eye is kind of a shameful thing and something that she does want to hide. So she, when she reveals it and she's still loved, not necessarily despite it, but as she's still loved with it, it kind of messes her up, which is really fun. I, I really like what Oda the direction Oda went with all this. As much as there's a part of me that says, no, Oda, commit this time. Don't do the same thing with her as you did with Violet, which again, Violet made sense. Don't get me wrong. Violet made sense that she was kind of a double agent, but, or that she turned on Doflamingo. It all makes sense, but I love a good betrayal plot. Even if I'm betrayed by it and I'm hurt by it and I'm gonna whine and throw a tantrum about it, I still love it. And so with Violet, I wanted I wanted to keep it in that direction. And then with Pudding, I was like, oh no, this is terrible and I love it, right? I don't want Pudding to be conflicted and to also still love Sanji and maybe betray her mom. Like, I don't want all this. But at the same time, I do like the way Oda's doing it. I don't know. He messes with a lot of tropes that I don't like or things that I don't like. And then the way he does it, I'm like, well, okay. So I'm not mad about it. Anyway, Luffy and all the other Luffy's come exploding in. It's chaos. Mom wants to know who the real Luffy is, but I mean, surely it's fine. He's not gonna give himself up. Except that he completely did. He's like, it's me, I'm the real Luffy, let's fight. I love Luffy. Tag gum. Uh, we get this incredible, incredible line with Jinbei. Man, I love Jinbei! Where, um, where mom says, should I take this as rebellion? And he says, please do. Ah, oh, I love him. He's the best. And the joy on Luffy's face when Jinbei is formally announcing his rebellion and that he's gonna join up with the Straw Hats. The, 
Oh, I love it. Oh, yeah, that line. A man who would be a crewmate of the future pirate king cannot afford to tremble in the presence of a mere emperor. <gasps> Jimbe, you're so cool. And then in the background, you have Brooke being Brooke, the, 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 the shining star, the one that is constantly in the background making things happen. Oh my goodness, Brooke, you are so cool. Wearing the silly Luffy mask. I love the humor in this arc. Wearing the silly Luffy mask, Takes the picture oh so casually. I love the way he is so competent but so casual, and it's just like yeah, I just did, I just did the thing, you know. It's just like there's no arrogance there. Ah, why do I love this guy so much that I really just genuinely didn't like not that long ago? <sighs> so Brooke breaks. Oh, I'm so sorry. So Brooke breaks the picture. And then the chaos begins, as if, as if there's been no chaos before this moment. So today's sponsor, Lord of Maps, are hand-drawn maps. As of right now, they have 50 states and 15 countries and regions to choose from, but they're constantly working on more. He's actually working on some cities right now as well. So the collection is growing and growing. Lord of Maps right now is made up of two guys, the man who hand draws each and every one of the maps and his brother who joined on to help with marketing. The maps are so gorgeous and so reminiscent of classic fantasy style maps, but just of places that we're personally attached to. I highly recommend checking them out. I've already gotten several for my home and I'm starting to buy some for Christmas gifts for my friends and families because they're just really cool. And in purchasing from them, you are supporting a very small company with two really cool guys. Be sure to check them out. They will be linked in the description of this video as well as a discount code. Chaos. And then because of Luffy's spaghetti arms and determination, he uh, still shows mom the picture. She falls to her knees, cries. We try to blow her up, fail like we knew. And then we hide inside of Cigar Mouth. You know, Corey came up behind me as I was editing the last video. He was like, man, you're into some weird stuff. And as I talk about this, some of the things that are coming out of my mouth, I gotta say, you're not wrong. But anyway, in the midst of all the chaos of the screaming and, and the everybody like falling over with the pain of the screams, enter Sanji and it's such a cool entrance for him as he comes in to save his family and oh, it's just good stuff. So we have this big flashback for mom. It's actually not that big of a flashback in Oda terms. We have this big flashback for mom when she was a kid and she, the giant killing of the giant thing that I mentioned before, and so now she's exiled, she's been abandoned by her parents, so she's picked up by this really cool smoking nun who takes in orphans and lives in harmony with them. Mom's goal is to, Lilith, is that her, Lilin? What was her name? My mom. Big Mom's goal is to have an island where all races live in harmony. Now we find out that the woman who is mom's mom, Carmel, I think is her name. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just try to call her Carmel because this is gonna get confusing real fast. Carmel, that was her will. That was her desire. And and so I don't know if she inherited her will. I'm gonna be honest with you. I still don't fully grasp the what causes someone to inherit someone's will, but she definitely took on what she thought were Carmel's dreams. But it turns out that Carmel is an orphan trafficker. I don't know. She's a smoking nun. I guess I should have suspected her. That's what my patrons were laughing at me about. But I mean, I don't know. Oda can make literally any character look any kind of way and they could be good or bad. So what do I know? I don't really let appearances decide things too much as far as if I think someone's going to be good or bad. I mean, look at Crocodile. He looks so cool. He should be good. Look at Buggy. He's a murderous clown and he's the coolest character in the whole series. Okay, so anyway, mom, mom's mom, not mom, Carmel, but she's like her mother figure. She took her in, was raising her up. Turns out that she's a horrible human and I instantly wanted her to die because you don't mess with kids. You don't mess with kids. It's, 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 basic rule for me. 
Nothing will make me hate you faster. <laughs> but I mean, she got eaten, so I guess whatever. So anyway, I don't know. This is, this is a mess. She ate her mom and siblings. And then, like, absorbed. So, Carmel's powers were really cool. Now, after she ate her, she can suddenly do her tricks. And, obviously, we've seen her doing her tricks all throughout. So, I guess, I don't know. It's Oda. I guess he decided you don't just have to consume a devil fruit in order to get the powers. You could just consume the person who has the devil fruit. I mean, all right. I was gonna, I was trying to hunt down the book book guy to kill him to get his devil fruit, but I guess I could just... Man, Oda's weird. So they're all hiding inside of Cigar Guy, and Luffy, in true Luffy fashion, is just wanting to hit Big Mom. He just wants to fight her. He just wants to go head to head, even though she is ridiculously powerful. So I love this panel of Chopper uh, going into one of his beefier forms just so he can hold her back. I just uh, hold him back. I just, it's a really good panel. This whole confrontation that we get between Sanji and his not father, uh, him saying, uh, whenever he asked him, why, why did you save us? And he said, because my father would be sad if I fixated on the childhood hatred from my past. Oh, oh. And really just that entire confrontation of him telling him, you're not my father. And um, I really, really like this of, I feel an obligation to not let you die in this way, but I want to be real clear, you're still not my dad. Nothing has changed here. It's just, it's a really good Sanji moment. Uh, the, the, the family go out to fight mom or to try to handle things. And unsurprisingly, when sister is in trouble, one of the brothers who is emotionless, who has no capacity to feel for her says, leave her behind. It's her fault for being too weak. I love the scene where both Sanji and Luffy come to protect her. And then they have a little, a little Sanji and Zoro-esque squabble uh, where, where Luffy says, uh, he's like mad at Sanji because he's like, I thought you said that I'm not, that we're not supposed to fight, even as he's fighting. And then Sanji's like, well, I was only talking about you. And Luffy's response, not fair. It's just, this is good. Luffy having to have his big dramatic, after I handle this, I'm coming back for you. I love his tenacity, even though mom has proven herself to be ludicrously strong. Uh, and which I think, let me see here. I might have things out of order, but when he goes to punch her and she just easily deflects it, and that was the punch, according to one of my patrons, I'm not gonna take credit for this because I did not catch it, but according to one of my patrons, that was the punch that did this to Doflamingo back in Dressrosa, and yet mom just casually deflected it. Oh man, she's so powerful. And Luffy's just like, I I'll be back. I'll be handling you. I love his confidence, his tenacity, his, ugh. And then, Lu and then mom hits not dad with a thunderbolt, which mm, wouldn't be a lightning bolt. Doesn't matter. She hits him with a thunderbolt which I'm not worried about. Dad's probably, not dad's probably still alive because we spent, Oda spent an entire arc in Skypiea establishing for us that literally anyone could survive any number of lightning bolts and be totally fine. But anyway, everybody's captured. We're all in a pickle, but then that pickle is immediately undone because of chaos. This is one of those sections of, of the arc that is so chaotic and so all over the place that I don't feel like I have to tear it apart, so we're just gonna breeze right past it. So the crew is free, but mom is in a rage because her cake is destroyed and she wants her cake. But because of the series of complicated events, Baker saved everybody, but he's out for the count. So Sir Licks a lot tells her, oh, we have another cake for you, but uh, you gotta go get it by killing Luffy, which is both very clever and very stupid. So, um, they're on the run. I love, so Mr. Cigar, sir. Beige, is that his name? Maybe I should try to learn his name. Nah, it's not easily right in front of me, so he's gonna stay who he is. I did not expect to enjoy this character so much. When I met him, I just thought, okay, another character, right? Like Oda assaults us with a lot of characters. And I don't really mind the way he does it because I have kind of made the rule of thumb of if they're important, they'll make themselves known and then I will 
care about them. If they're not, then they'll be fodder to show me how massive this world is, how big a foe is. Like with mom and all of her kids, all of her army that were just introduced to one after another, I don't feel any need to remember any of them except for the ones that make themselves known to me. Everybody else, it's like, okay, you're just showing me how intense this army of people that we're facing off against is. I think he does a fine job at that. And Cigar Mouth was one of those people that I was like, okay, you just exist. You have a weird devil fruit. You have this mafia type feel to you. Whatever, live your life. I like him so much and I just didn't expect to. Uh, he has, I really, really like this scene where he <laughs> has been on our Straw Hats team the whole time, but he also makes very clear to them, I don't care what happens to you. I'm trying to protect my family and my men. And then he has this scene where he like puts a sign and he's like, go that direction. And then the sign is pointing mom to him and he's like, I'm just trying to protect my own. Bye. And it's just like, it's so good. But anyway, mom's on her rampage and then we have pudding. This is where we get to start to get the really conflicted, really hilarious, I love pudding so much. And she's just, oh, I love her character. I shouldn't. I do. So basically Pudding devises this plan of we can totally make this cake. I've got the supplies. Um, my sister, who is currently defected and on the run, can take care of some of it and Sanji can take care of the rest. So uh, she goes and collects her sister. I really like I really like the dynamics between them a lot. And then they go and collect Sanji. But before we even get to them collecting Sanji, we have more chaos that I'm once again gonna very briefly mention and skip over because it was hilarious to read and a ton of fun, but it's not really worth my breaking down at this point. Um, Nami befriends a tree and a cloud. And it's all hilarious and fun and also very sad when Tree gets burnt, the tree is defecting and he's trying to fight for his fiance. Oh. And uh, and then he gets burned and then Cloud Zeus is being uh, following Nami uh, because she's feeding him those clouds. It's hilarious. Anyway, he ends up getting puffed up as a th thundercloud, but Nami realizes she can control him. Huge bolt of lightning. Mom goes down into the earth, but she can't be stopped. And it's just, it's chaos. It's chaos. It's fun. I really enjoyed it. However, with all that said, I do feel a bit disappointed about Mom in this section of the arc. I have loved the way Oda has depicted her up to this point. She's been this very vague, looming presence where I feel like I've gotten so little information on her throughout the majority of this arc. And so there's so much mystery of what she could be. And we it's made very clear how incredibly powerful and ruthless she is, yet still there's this complexity. There's this underlying, okay, but why are you handling things this way? Like you're clearly bad, but there's also this mystery around maybe some something more nuanced to you. And then the way he draws her, this looming, lumbering, terrifying presence. There's so much that I've loved about mom's character. And I've just been so excited to learn more about her. And the more I learn about her and the deeper we get into her, getting to have her more active in the arc, the less I'm loving her character. And it's like, it's, I think it's just because she kind of moved on from this looming, lumbering, terrifying presence into kind of like this kid throwing a tantrum because she's hungry and she wants a treat. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be a brat about it. I do think that it makes sense for her backstory, it makes sense for her character, and her being on a hunger rampage chasing down the straw hats is still terrifying. Like she's still a force that is that is very scary and and a looming threat that's that's huge. So I don't want to diminish her power. It's just that she kind of moved from this very ominous presence to almost like this comedic presence that I don't like as much. It just doesn't hit the same way for me. Um, so mom's character, I was loving her so much and now I don't love her as much. I don't dislike her and I don't think that she's poorly written. I think it makes sense. It's just, I don't know. It, I don't like, I don't like it as much. Her hunger pangs rampage is still forceful and terrifying, but also 
it just doesn't really hit the same and I'm not liking it the same. With all that said, a brief intermission to talk about the cover pages. Odo did a lot of fan request pages, which were all adorable and fun, but then he started going into uh, cover stories again. I don't know, I might be using the wrong terminologies here, but anyway, we're following the beautiful pirates. We're following uh, Bart and all of them as, I guess they're not the beautiful pirates anymore. They're Luffy's fleet. And we're following them rampaging trying to spread Luffy's name and it's it's been fun it's been a good time except that they went after Shanks they burned Shanks's flag and I hope he's okay what is happening listen I understand that Shanks is not going to be killed off page it's not gonna happen he's too significant of a presence for that to happen but I need an update right now on what's going on with him and his crew and if they're okay. And I know that Oda will not provide anything for me right now, but I am concerned. Back to present time. I love this whole thing with Pudding. Pudding being so conflicted, her coming to the crew and speaking terror over them, and then her sister reminding her, that's not what we do now. She was like, oh yeah, I'm not supposed to be evil. And then she's evil again, and then she's not. And it's both hilarious and devastating that she has that she's so entrenched in this looming evil presence that she's had to be for so long. But just that one compliment has tilted her so heavily that she just doesn't really know what to be anymore. That she's been so beaten down about her appearance and about being, um, about being ugly or being gross or being sick. And so this one compliment has so turned her upside down that she's still trying to be this evil looming force but no, she's not supposed to be, but she loves Sanji, but no, she doesn't want Sanji, and she's just a mess, and it's it's equal parts hilarious and really, really sad. But I love her explaining her plan, and, and Sanji just being like, okay, yep, I will help, and she's like, no, no, you're not invited, and then she's so powerful, and she just handles the seducing woods so easily and lets the, the straw hats go and then realizes that Sanji's been on the carpet with them the whole time and then it's a mess and it's chaos and this whole section is just wonder. I just love pudding. I shouldn't. She's betrayed me, but I just love pudding. Oh man, and then, oh gosh, this is just so intense. There's so much happening in this whole section. And then Luffy and future seeing guy are now facing off. You know what? I don't know. Oh man, so many. Okay, I'm gonna start with Pedro. <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna start with Pedro. So Pedro saying, um, they've been waiting for them for centuries. Luffy and his friends are those whom our people and the Kazuki clan have awaited for centuries, the one who will guide us into the dawn of the world. So Oda has laid so many seeds here already, directly connecting Luffy with the glyphs, right? Like he has done it several times, but the one that's the most forefront in my mind was in Fishman Island with the prophecy of the one who will come. And, you know, it really seemed to tie into the princess and the promise that someone had given to her, some sort of joy boy. I still don't know who joy boy is or what anything, but it's all, I'm trying to keep a hold of all that because it's gonna come together eventually. But there's been a lot of things that have come up that have really connected Luffy and his crew with these glyphs almost in a chosen one-esque sort of way. I don't know if Oda's gonna play with the chosen one trope, but that is what it's looking like he's leading up to. He's really connecting Luffy with, look, there are prophecies about someone who's gonna come, who's going to guide us to the dawn of the world. And there's been several different verbiages of what this one is going to come to do. And Luffy is very clearly being connected to that one. It's obviously gonna be Buggy because Buggy can't fall up any better than he does. And he's just gonna fall his way into being the chosen one. I'm kidding, a little bit. I really hope it's Buggy, but it's probably gonna be Luffy. So Luffy is clearly connected to these glyphs and I just can't wait until they're all put together and read and we realize what Oda's been leading up to for decades. Um, but anyway, <sighs> so Pedro, who's already lost most of his lifespan and he knows that he's at the end of his life anyway, sacrifices himself for us. And <sighs> We already know that people in this world can survive massive explosions. Pell. So 
it's possible that Pedro is still alive. I really hope he's not because this sacrifice, this moment for him was so incredible. I mean, this is a character that I was really hesitant to fall for because I was suspicious of him for no good reason. And now it's just, oh man, he is such a wonderful character and his sacrifice in this moment, it hit me so hard. And I really hope Oda doesn't steal that from me by doing another fake out. I really don't think that that's what this is. So this was a really good scene. I really love this character. And, and as well as because Pedro really is nailing in that connection between the cliffs, um, right before he sacrifices himself for this person who he really thinks the glyphs are talking about, you know? It's just, obviously the minks and the samurai are very strongly connected. And I know that we're going to Wano after this. So we're gonna get a lot more information soon. And I'm really excited about that. Oh, also that little, that little bitty Pedro flash, flashback we got, where he says, if I can lay the foundation for the dawning of the world that the men I look up to await, I'll be happy. I'm certain I have enough time for that. Getting that flashback as he's making the sacrifice, like, surely this sacrifice is legit because that is too intense, you know? Like, that is too significant for Oda showing us there's something big here, right? Oh, man. It's a really good scene. Anyway, this fella, uh, this future telly fella, Charlotte, um, I really don't remember his name. I'm so curious about him. He's a really interesting character. I really don't know anything about him yet, but his design is cool. I love his little scarf. And, uh, and him being able to see into the future just a little bit definitely adds a layer of, oh no, this fight's gonna be hard. But Luffy and his incredible, uh, <sighs> tenacity maybe is the word I want to use and him saying you know you, you may be able to see but you're still not going to be able to dodge my punch or something like that I don't remember the line um you know he's there there's a new level to him with being able to see a little bit into the future that adds another very ominous feel to him he's clearly extraordinarily powerful and loyal so he's not going to just turn his back on mom like several uh, of her of her minions have done so far with the cigar guy and with the tree and with Zeus and you know she's had several people kind of question their their loyal oh and Jinbei of course several people either defect or question their loyalty to her people and creatures I guess but obviously he's not going to he's gonna fight for mom to the death right and to also his powers both confuse and excite me where'd my phone go um, I have it on my phone, not in my notes, which is not as helpful. But anyway, Jimbe said that he has the Moki Moki fruit, which I don't know what that means. Um, but he called it special paramethia. Sorry, I still, I, sorry. But the third, the third type of fruit, right? The one that Luffy has where it's kind of just like a catch-all. If it's not Logia, if it's not... Zhao, Zo. Oh no, Zoan, Zoan. Then it's this third one. You can escape if there's enough moisture, but try not to touch it. So you can escape if there's enough moisture, but try not to touch it. But also he can stretch similar to how Luffy is. So he seems to have powers that act really similarly to Luffy's, except we don't want to touch it. And you can escape if there's enough moisture. So like, let's go back to Arabasta real quick. And, and gather my favorite boy. But I just, I just really love that character and it reminds me of Crocodile again. It doesn't matter. The point is, I don't really know what his abilities are yet and I'm confused because as far, so I'm not gonna pretend I understand the three different types of devil fruits as well as I should at this point. I don't, it still kind of goes over my head a little bit. I understand that the Zoan fruits can turn you into animals, the Logia fruits can make you, it's, uh, I think it's like, it has to be a natural element, but it also means that you can kind of li liquid liquefy yourself. Like you punch, if you try to punch then they can just kind of liquefy themselves. I don't know the right way to use it. So I understand, I don't know the right way to say it. So I understand that, but you can also, there's a certain type of hockey that you can do to combat that Logia, which is huge. 
and then and then there's the third, which is what this person has, which kind of is the catch-all. It's everything else. It's horror. Row. It's it's all the great things. But I also know that this guy is kind of sort of Logia type too, because there was definitely a moment where he liquefied himself. Yeah, right there, where Luffy was trying to punch through him, and he totally did the thing. <sighs> So maybe a special third type of fruit that I can't pronounce means that it's kind of a combination. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what he can do, but he fascinates me. And the fact that his powers seem to be, they seem to act in a similar way to Luffy's, but we shouldn't touch him unless there's enough moisture and, but he can see a little bit into the future. It's fascinating. I'm excited. We're obviously about to have a really big fight with him because Luffy took him into the mirror world and then shattered that mirror, which was so cool. And that's where I stopped. That's where I ended it. So I assume that we're about, I'm about to read a really intense battle, a really intense fight between the two. And I, I'm excited about it. Even though fight scenes, you know, Oda, Oda's fight scenes are great, but it's not what I read One Piece for. I read One Piece for the characters and for the emotions and for the nuance and for the mysteries and for all the little connections that you get to tear apart and theorize and, and, and try to understand. And I read One Piece for a lot of reasons, but the fights aren't it. The fights are great, but that's not what I read One Piece for. But I'm really excited for this one because, um... I don't, I don't know, this character really, it seems really cool. I don't know. Anyway, that's how far I've read up to. That is where I am. I'm having a wonderful time. This arc so far has been great. So, um, yeah, I've had a great time on Whole Cake, Whole Cake Island. I think that the island itself is awesome. I think that the different factors around it are great. I'm loving the crew. I'm loving Brooke. I'm loving Jinbei. I'm loving what we're doing with Sanji. Pudding is incredible. I just, I like so many things. I'm having a wonderful time. Anyway, I can hear my husband and my daughter coming down to get me. I've been here long enough. So we'll stop it here. Please chat with me more in the comments. Clarify stuff that I've missed or misunderstood, please. Um, and thanks for hanging out with me. And I'm sorry again for my voice. Hopefully in the next video, it'll be better. Uh, but I post videos every Tuesday through Friday. I'll see you again soon. Bye.